males in our rehabilitation centers than females. Child care. Because no males are using drugs. <laughs> According to the word data, yes, no? According to the word data I presented earlier, one female should need access for every three males. No, but in the Philippines, we have one female accessing facilities for every 14 males. Why is this? What do you think is the reason? Because we only have two female facilities in the country right now. No? We only have two. Uh, one is uh, in Bikutan. I think you're all aware, no? yung Tampagong Liwa facility natin. It houses females. No? The other one is in Cebu, in Eversley Sanitary, the Region 7. So if you're a female and you want to access treatment, a treatment facility, you need to go to a private facility or if you want to, if you don't have uh, money to pay for your treatment, then you only have two government facilities providing services. One is in uh, NCR, the other one is in Cebu. Another uh, point that I need to emphasize as far as this slide is concerned is the substance use as far as uh, admissions to rehab centers are concerned. Previously, in 2014, the number one drug of choice as far as those admitted in these facilities are concerned is Shabu, followed by marijuana, and then in Haylands. In 2015, it's still Shabu, no? followed by marijuana, but this time we have cocaine validating the 2015 survey that cocaine is already present in our, uh, in our communities. Okay. Just to show you that we have around 44 treatment and rehab centers nationwide and uh, 16 of those facilities are government operated. The rest are privately uh, owned. No? But we still have five regions without residential treatment and rehab centers. So we don't have treatment and rehabilitation centers in ARM, Autonomous Region of uh, in, uh, Muslim Mindanao, Region 12, uh, Mimaropa, Region 4B, Region 2, it's still under construction. We have uh, one in uh, Isabela, no? uh, but it's uh, still not yet operational. And we don't have any inpatient facility in the Cordillera Administrative Region. So we still have five regions without existing inpatient treatment and rehab centers. Now, as far as uh, law enforcement data is concerned, I think later on your uh, director for operations will have better figures no, as far as the enforcement data is concerned. But let me give you just some of the statistics provided to us by PDEA. In 2015, the price of Shabu ranges from 1,200 to 15,000 per gram. Uh, in the same year, uh, the law enforcement agencies were able to arrest almost uh, 90,400 individuals no? and the following were seized. No? Now, out of this arrest, out of the 19,400 individuals, we filed around 22,000 cases. Usually, usually we file more than one case per individual. And then, out of that number, out of the 19,000 arrested, 1,822 were considered high value targets. So what are high value targets? These are politicians, law enforcers, members of drug groups and armed groups, government employees, and foreign nationals. No? Majority of uh, government employees that were uh, apprehended were actually elected officials. No? Barangay captains, uh, tanons, as far as the law, in law enforcers are concerned, the highest ranking law enforcer that was uh, apprehended was a senior police superintendent. For government officials, the highest ranking government officials, uh, official that was uh, apprehended was a Sangunian uh, board member, provincial board member. Now, 38 foreign nationals were apprehended, and again, you can guess what country would be the number one foreign national. China. I doesn't show you, but it's China actually. So, 
Where are we now as far as the war on drugs is concerned? Now, this is based on uh, ABS-CBN, GMA-7 uh, data is concerned. This is the death toll as far as the war on drugs is concerned. No? As you can see, from May 10 to actually September 12, this is September 12. Uh, this is only up to August. It's not yet updated. No? But as you can see, there is an increasing trend of deaths. So far, as of August 2, 748 deaths. As of September 12, we already have 1,400 plus deaths uh, in the country. Also to show you the number of surrenderies, this is as of July 29, it was uh, around 532,000, but, but as of September, uh, September 10, we already have 690 plus surrenderies nationwide. Huh? Again, your, your uh, office for the directorate would have better figures. So what are the challenges as far as the Philippines is concerned? Number one, globalization. We expect, because of globalization, and we have already integrated with our ASEAN neighbors no, last September 2015, uh, with free trade, we, ex we expect free illicit trade. So we need to guard our ports of entries. We already have our airport interdiction to the task forces. Um, composed by PDEA, BNP. No? We are now trying to develop uh, seaport uh, interdiction task forces. Number two is the emergence of new psychoactive substances. As I mentioned, these substances cannot be detected by any drug test available right now um, in the Philippines. No? Majority of the substances being mixed, being introduced, are synthetic catenones. And we don't have any detection kits for those substances as of yet. I don't know if you're familiar with what happened in SM, the close-up event. Uh, five persons died, no? And according to the uh, forensic lab report, it's, uh, they used MDMA mixed with catenones. Uh, again, we also need to address the increasing numbers of persons who inject drugs positive with HIV. As I mentioned, the, this is predominantly happening in Region 7, but it's slowly expanding in the Mindanao areas as well as in Metro Manila. We now have reported seizures of liquid methamphetamine, and we suspect uh, they will be used for, uh, by injecting drug users. There is a need to expand access to services. As I mentioned, we only have two female facilities nationwide. We don't even have a specialized adolescent treatment and rehab center. If you are an adolescent and you want to access treatment, you need to go to a private uh, service provider. We don't have any government facility for that. Um, it's... It's good to know that right now, we already have our Philippine Health Insurance covering detoxification services in the country. However, we are still lobbying that inpatient programs should be covered by health insurance. No, but there's, they, they, they told us that it's too expensive for them to cover, but they're still studying the possibility of covering inpatient programs. Treatment and rehab interventions not subsumed okay. with continuing care provision so this is our weakest link as far as treatment is concerned no? there should be a smooth flow of continuing care from detox detox to the primary program to the community-based aftercare program and other support services right now that's the weakest link no, the only available service uh, service that we can provide would be the, the most stable one would be the primary program no, for inpatient programs. And later I will discuss to you the new algorithm that was developed by the Dangerous Drugs Board to address the number of uh, growing surrenderies. And finally, monitoring and assessment. And I think um, 
We are not alone. No? Philippines is not alone as far as uh, this concern. This, this is concerned. Even in the U.S., they have a weak standard success indicator. No? And globally, the standards are not yet set. When do you say that somebody who underwent treatment and rehab is already successful, is already cured? No? Again, there is no set standard indicator as far as this is concerned. They have, we have varying processes to validate program implementation in the country. Uh, for your information, we acknowledge four treatment and rehab programs. And I think some of you will be aware of this. I think you're all familiar with the therapeutic community program, the one being implemented in uh, Bigutan. We also have a 12 steps based program, Hazelden, Minnesota model. It's being implemented by some local government units, uh, uh, provincial uh, treatment and rehab uh, programs. No? We also have faith based uh, programs, and the fourth one would be a mix of all the three programs. Again, there is no standard indicator or process or process of validating these programs. As far as we're concerned, based on international literatures, these are the four most effective programs, but uh, we've yet to conduct any evaluation on them. So we're trying to develop the assessment tool on how to measure the impact of treatment and rehab programs in the country. So this is the National Anti-Drug Program of Action. This is the, uh, the document which outlines all our strategies as far as uh, drug prevention and control is concerned. No? So basically, what it tries to attempt is to strengthen supply and demand initiatives. If you recall, previously, way back 2005 to 2010, we have what we call the National Anti-Drug Plan of Action, which was implemented during the time of uh, President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. No? But this time, we have the 2015 to 2020 National Anti-Drug Program of Action. It's a successful document for the National Anti-Drug Plan of Action. This was uh, signed by the, by the previous administration, 2014, and it's still the strategy that uh, we're still following. Okay, so that's it. Let me present to you. Uh, any questions as far as these statistics are concerned? Is it clear? Do we have a big problem as far as uh, drug abuse is concerned? Okay, so let me just review. I mentioned earlier that according to the World Drug Report, around 0.6% of the drug using population would be problematic drug users. No? So if we talk about if we talk about 1.8 million drug users according to, 20, to the 2015 survey conducted by uh, a private organization, if we talk about 1.7 1.8 million drug users in the country, 0.6% or uh, roughly uh, let's uh, round it up to 1%, no? 1% of uh, 1.8 million would be how many? 180. Around 18.